And I'm also going to be consulting with the deep ecologists and then this other hybrid panel. Wentz, you're part of a panel with Chris and uh, Tara now, okay? You guys are going to have a strong panel. You guys are going to be very interested to talk to each other, I think. All right? So does that sound fair? So who has yet to be identified? You said you have. So where do you want to go? Is there any Group B spots left? Group B conservationists, I believe. Um, we know the Group A's are all filled up. We know everything on that side is filled up. But is there, yeah, there's room for you. So your, your colleagues, tell me your name again. Isaac. Isaac, Isaac Leineweber, that's right. I thought of you, I, in fact, I ticked off your name as one that, uh, anyway, your partners, your colleagues are Marissa. Where's Marissa? There you are. Marissa and um, Lauren. Where's Lauren? There's Lauren. Okay, so Lauren and Marissa and Isaac. All right, you guys are the group B so you guys are going to mine the classical Leopold, but you also have access to Norton, and you also have access to Wilson. Okay, you guys get that, right? Remember on my wheel, those guys are, those guys are considered kind of refinements of group, B, of group Bs, but the Group Bs are resolutely anthropocentric still, okay? Which is why you guys are in the anthro-enviro community, right? Alongside the social ecologists. And the social ecologists include Dakota, Stephanie, and who else? Who else hasn't been identified yet as a panel member? What's your name? Derek. Derek Samples. Yeah. Right on. So Derek, are you down with social ecology? Yeah. Okay. So there we go. So Derek, Stephanie, and Dakota. All right. Dakota, Stephanie is here with, and then. Dakota is here, and Derek, okay? Is that fair? How do you, is it D-E-R-I-K? D-E-R-I-C. I see, that's right. All right. Um, and then do we have any, any, any interest in, an eco, in a separate eco-feminist panel? Yes, go ahead. Question, um, is there any specific order to this? Do we to yes, I have it on the schedule. Okay. There is an order, absolutely. I'll go over that next and then we'll take a break, all right? And then, we'll, and then we'll spend as much time as we can on environmental virtue ethics and then we'll knock off at 1.30 and let you guys do your thing, all right? So, but the answer is yes, I have it all scheduled out and I have the, the order of presentation in the schedule, all right? Um, uh, and tell me your name again? Lauren. Lauren. Lauren Mash. All right, yes, uh, I have Helen. I just kind of on process. So as an ecologist, we're going to work together and then we're going to give information to, like, email. No, you're not going to email anything to me. All I do is come in on the day of judgment, on judgment day. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so who's our coordinator then? You are a social ecologist? No, I'm no, a excuse me. deep ecologist. You're a deep ecologist. So you're part of the non-anthro environmental community, mm -hmm. and I am your coordinator. Okay, so... That's right. So, and then, so, I, so, so you guys have... So I will meet with you guys, and then I'll also meet with those guys. Or you can take the opportunity now to step up to a coordinator role. No, it's okay. No, I'm happy to do that because these are the trickiest kinds of arguments that make the least, you know, that are physical, philosophically puzzling and hard to, for a young, for a, you know, for a beginning person in environmental ethics, it's harder, perhaps. I don't know. I'm happy to do that. That's okay. So we'll set up a time to meet, though, okay? Um, uh, so... You, and, anyway, let's finish this, all right? Uh, yeah, you and Derek and Dakota. No, you, I'm sorry, no, that's, I'm thinking of the social ecologists. Marissa, Lauren, and Vincent. Okay? Marissa, Lauren, and Vincent are one panel, we, we are, no, excuse me, what am I saying? Who else just, <laughs> who got to be the, uh, who got to be the other group B conservationist? Isaac, Isaac did, okay. <laughs> All right, and I got to be the other, um, I just got to be the other coordinator is all I got to be. All right, and we don't have an eco-feminist panel. Are there any other strays who found, actually got fortunate to find their way into the classroom today? Some strays are out there and floating around. Okay, where do you want to go in? Um, okay, um, what do you want to do? Katie, I'm sorry. Kate. So Katie's going to be our uh, one eco-feminist, and then 
You're Brianna? Yeah. Brianna, are you down with that stuff or you want to be a do you want to be an onanthro or an anthro? <laughs> if you want to be an anthro, then you could be um, an ecofeminist and that's it. That's the only spot available if you want to be an anthro. So that maybe that would be wise to make another panel. And is there yet a third person who hasn't yet been uh, assigned to a panel yet? No? So that's it. You guys are the last two. So we have to figure out whether or not you're going to be, uh, you know, if we got really wild, then we could have cross, you know. We could have one of you be, uh, be the uh, Vancouver energy informant who has to cross over from, you know, who has to, <laughs> anyway. But no, we won't do that. That's too, that would be too confusing. But Katie wants to go somewhere. Um, so Chris, you're part of a panel. We've consolidated Chris, Wentz, and, and who else now? Oh, uh, who else? Oh, Tara, that's right. You guys are in an environmental virtue ethics slash indigenous panel. Is that fair enough, Tara? All right. So Wentz, Chris, and Tara, all right? You guys are together. Okay, and these guys are all. All right, and so the only two, so, um, well, Katie, would you, do you, do you have more affinities with a, an anthropocentric perspective or a more than anthropocentric perspective? More than. Well, I think we should just, we should, um, we should add you to the, and then Brianna, are you more comfortable with an anthropocentric environmentalist perspective? Uh, Why don't we add you to, to their group? Why don't we add you to the, uh, to the social ecologists? Is okay. that fair? Yeah. Okay, so you're a social ecologist, and then Katie, you are uh, part of the environmental virtue ethics slab, or do you want to be a deep ecologist? I just, you, should, you should belong to either the indigenous slash environmental virtue panel, or you should belong to the deep ecology panel. Okay. All right. So now you guys have four of you. That sounds good. All right, so Wentz, you just acquired another panelist. All right. With Katie. So you guys have to exchange email. Everyone has to exchange email addresses before you depart this room today. All right. But I have all of you now in your particular position. All right. So we're done with that. And uh, let's go ahead and take a five minute break and then come back and we'll spend about 40 minutes on our uh, environmental virtue ethics for today. All right. So come back at, at 11 minutes to one. And then we'll uh, wrap things up. Hi. Did you dye your hair? Is that what you did? It's always been that color? Yeah. Really? I, I, don't, I don't know why. I get people all mixed up in my head. Um, you know, I... Did I leave a bunch of essays here last class? Because I, I don't have any. Uh, um, but what's your last name? Risen. That's right, Risen. Yeah, it's not pronounced Risen. So, oh wait a minute now. So I don't. No, I haven't graded it yet. Okay. I don't know. I'll have to print it out. I'm not sure if I printed it out yet or not. But. And is it okay if I opt for writing a paper? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're not, so I didn't put you in any slot anywhere? Uh, I was going to be a groupie, but there's two others. Okay. Um, yeah, if you want to write a paper, that's fine. So that means it's just Lauren and Isaac now are the only two as social ecologists. So maybe, maybe we should ask, um, I mean, excuse me. As groupie, yeah, so maybe we should ask one of the, uh, maybe we should ask Katie to be. Uh, or me. Or you, you want to do that? No, yeah, I'm so Brianna, you do that. With group B conservationists. Okay. All right? Okay. I'm with Isaac and Hicks. You're with Isaac and Lauren. Okay. Lauren is the one that sits in right by the window okay. over there. So for my paper, should I 
um, since this is the last class. What do you want to write about? Just send me an no, email. No, I mean my midterm. Oh, your midterm will be due. Let's just have it be due on the day of the I've final exam. I've already turned it in, the one that you're working on grading. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Your essay you've already turned in, but your final exam, if you want to do a written final exam, then just have it be due the day of the final exam. Is that yeah. all right? Okay, but I'm talking about the paper that you extended. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, and I haven't graded it yet, so I'll just, I'll have to grade it today. Just send me an email and ask me about it. I'll okay. send you back here. And should I, like, come to class on the final day and up, or? Um, if you want to, yeah. Okay. Now, you are going to write something, too? Or yes. what's your story? Yes. You, so you, you don't have any space on here at all? Yes, I won't. Okay, good. That's right, you won't be here. Yeah. All right. Um, and should I just... So what do you want to write about? I don't know. What are the options? Is it the CEO policy? Yeah, I can, I can send you. Just send me an email telling me that you want to write something, all right? And I'll send okay. you a, a, a few options. Okay, okay, that's perfect. And then I want to know, do you have a uh, grade our, our term papers yet? Yeah, um, and I gave you, I gave you a 94, but I don't know what happened. I don't. I think I might have left some papers in the room because I don't. Maybe they're somewhere in my office, but I. Anyway, I don't maybe know what less happened. Than found has them, if they yeah, were no. Usually they just leave everything here. Maybe they're over here. But anyway, but I gave you a 94. Oh, but and and I'll try to find it. I'll try to find it. I didn't make very many comments on any of them, so. Okay, that's okay. I just wanted to kind of know what where like stuff. Right? Yeah. Uh -huh. So now you know. Kind of. Oh, I have to do very well in the final, and I think I could get an A because I did. I got fifteen on my first two, mm -hmm. and then I think I got a B on the midterm, but I got. All my other essays, summaries, I got I got some. Mm -hmm. so, so you'll get an A or an A minus, probably, huh? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, and sure. I'll send you an email today. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to let you know I was gonna uh, write the paper. I have a really what's your name? Tomorrow. Oh, Mara, okay, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, no worries. Um, so send me an email. Yeah. And I'll send you some options, maybe two or three different options. <laughs> okay, great. Looking forward to it. Okay. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss this class. Really? Yeah, enjoyed it a lot. Good. I mean, I'm a philosophy major. It's actually yeah, it's my a last lot of class fun. as an undergraduate, too. Really? Yeah. Wow. Well, you picked the right one. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, it's a really cool class, huh? It was. It's too know, bad that it doesn't have, it's marginalized in, the, in everywhere. It's marginalized in every department, you know? Really? Yeah, in the philosophy department, it's marginalized by people who think that it's too, you know, it's, it's, it's not sufficiently rigorous. Especially the way I teach it, perhaps that would be one criticism. It's not rigorous enough. It's too, too loose, you know, and it's, there's too much social, it's too overtly social political. It, it, I didn't feel that it was too socially heavy, though. Yeah. You know. Um, well, we spent all that time on those meta-ethical questions, so yeah. and that's why I was the heart of the course. And I struggled to make all that stuff more relevant to the average student who's not a philosophy major. But we have to include all that because that's what we have to contribute. But in the end, it all got resolved from a more over. It really got resolved from a pragmatist point of view. You know, the test of those theories is whether or not they help our experience of our, 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 our understanding of our experience of values in nature. And ultimately, what Birch says is absolutely correct, I think. You know? And that, so that whole meta-ethical project is kind of bankrupt. And it's just time to move on. And the more interesting questions are, after you've accepted that we're going to be holists, you know, then the more interesting questions about how all these different frameworks might relate to each other. Yeah. You know? and, and to look critically at, at right, that's, that was one advantage of studying that meta-ethical material, is now we can understand deep ecology a lot more easily. Right? We have the theoretical material to understand deep ecology yeah. and to see what might be wrong with it, right? Yeah. And see where a guy like Rolston might actually be on track, you know, even though in the end he's unacceptable too because of his meta-ethical objectivism and he upholds his Cartesian, you know, seems to me anyway, so. You think so? I mean, I, I mean, I was going to say, uh, Sorry. Rolston oh, makes it. I love it. Yeah, I love it. No, no, Rolston makes some bad mistakes, I think, some meta-ethical errors. 
you know, I mean, Rolston just flat out contradicts my hero, William James, right? He just, you know, Rolston wants to say that, 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 I don't know, man, but, you know, I, this weird, I have this weird relationship with Rolston, because on one hand, I want to, I want to agree with, because I find myself being what very sympathetic to, like, a neo-Kantian perspective, but just sympathetic, I, I tend to... I pragmatize that, yeah. though. I add some William James and some John Dewey, and, and I... And I re I reinterpret what Rolston's talking about as another feature of experience. Okay. And and if you if you go back and read, for example, John Dewey's account of the generic features of experience, then it's really not a stretch. Even though they didn't think this way at all, you know, to them that you had to be pretty much a human or some other really sentient being. Yeah. To to have enough of a cognitive apparatus, you know, for there to be a moral claim, right? Sure. But from Rolston's point of view, from Rolston says, wait a minute now, species make moral claims too, right? Sure. I mean, that's how a pragmatist might interpret, and, and I'm down with that, right? If you want to say that a species over evolutionary time makes moral claims, time, right? But to call that, to then, to then import this language of intrinsic value from this other tradition, which comes out of G.E. Moore and the analytic, British analytic philosophers, yeah. to me, that's where Rolston makes his mistakes and he gets himself in all this meta-ethical trouble. Whereas if he had just drawn on pragmatism okay. to begin with. But he doesn't want to because he wants to disagree with the pragmatists on, on the status of, of value judgments. He yeah. wants to say they're objectively real. I, I always find it hard to make that leap that he did, that, that something having intrinsic value yeah. in itself objectively. It's, yeah. it's difficult to kind of uh -huh. ground that. Um, but couldn't you say a species you know, is responding to its environment over a long period of time and therefore it's experiencing something? And therefore, it's making a moral claim toward its own integrity and toward its prime adaptability, right? Isn't it? Yeah. Making a claim to that. And so, if we're disrupting that, then from a pragmatist point of view, we're denying the reality of one one important set of moral claims. And as pragmatists, we have to we have to throw those in the mix, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's interesting. We should get back to our yeah. lecture. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so for the whole thing, it'd be like a court case, right? And like, so like we would come up and make our That's right. point yeah. of view and perspective on uh -huh. it. And what are so you part of? The social economy. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, but you guys won't need. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Let me see how I have this for. Um, so from it'll start with the three heavies on both sides. Okay, the three heavies on one. The three the three energy heavies will have twenty minutes. Then the three enviro heavies will have twenty minutes. And you guys aren't part of that at all. You guys will contribute to it back behind the scenes, right? Okay. Only behind the scenes. You won't be part of that. Next up, three. Okay, the energy consultants. So it's like the coordinator. The, 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 the pan actually, so those guys do have to do more work. Yes. Okay. Those, the panelists on that group, and then when it comes to you guys, though, you guys from 11:15, 11:30, you guys are making uh, a, a spokesperson for. And that, and you guys have what two different panels in your right? Oh no, awesome. Yeah. Are you you're in the environmental social? Yeah. What was your name? Dakota. Yeah. Dakota, that's right. And you're so you were saying that social, uh, social ecology. Social ecology. Awesome. So you guys don't actually have yeah. to speak. We just got your panelists don't website. have to speak. You have yeah, to give input to your leader, um, to Ashton. So, okay, and then he'll okay. So as because like you're a social ecologist, right? You're you're Derek. Yeah. Yeah. All right, man. Yeah. So you'll give you have to give input to Ashton. That's it. So are we um, feeding them arguments and kind of leading them in a direction, or are we just kind of seeing what they come up with? See what they come up with, okay. yeah. Cool. Sounds good. So, uh, we will not have to be You can speak, though. Look, everyone can speak. If you want to, then you can. Yeah, there will be a question answer period when everyone's done. There'll be more time for anybody in the room to speak. Anybody. My, my concern is what I hate to do. I'm having to leave in 15 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I miss you on Thursday? Tuesday? Oh, that's right. That's right. We talked. Okay, sorry. Yeah, we got to get back to this stuff. So, that's going to still be okay. What's happening? Right. What is going to be open? It's still going to be okay, but at least from 11 to 11 to 30, so I can get to my point. Oh, today you mean? Thursday, next Thursday, the day of the final, the day of the discussion. Oh, yeah, of All course that. that's okay, yeah. Okay. You're not, yes, of course that's okay. okay. Don't worry about that. All right, so let's, let's see how much of uh, environmental virtue ethics we can get through. I was wondering if I could do an essay. You don't want to be part of this? Uh, no. 
That's okay. Yeah, do an essay. Don't worry about it. Send me an email and I'll give you a couple different options. All right. All right? Yeah, no worries. Okay, so this is where we left off on Tuesday with uh, Wallace Stegner. Um, yeah, I guess we'll just go over the... Um, <coughs> We'll just, uh, we'll, I think what we'll do is just go over the, uh, the essay by Philip Cafaro uh, and his effort to read Aldo Leopold. I guess it's nice to come around at the end after all the time we spent earlier in the term to revisit the work of Aldo Leopold and maybe uh, read his contributions from a different, slightly different perspective. But uh, Philip Cafaro is a colleague of, of Holmes Ralston actually at Colorado State in uh, wherever that is. Fort Collins, I think, is where it is. Anyway, um, and he wrote this amazing essay, I think, that certainly uh, makes a very important contribution to our subject, which we just started to cover. We really did. We just started to cover. Um, and I wish we could, I wish we had more time, because uh, our treatment of virtue ethics is, is going to be woefully inadequate. Um, but uh, the, the guiding question of vir virtue ethics in many ways is fundamentally different. It's a fundamentally different, in a sense, it's not even a normative tradition, okay? But nowadays, when you take an ethics class at any university, really this is, this is gonna include whether it's a secular liberal arts university or even all, any kind of Abrahamic religious university, whether it's a Catholic Jesuit school or what have you, you're going to study virtue ethics. And of course you're gonna study the two, the two traditions that have defined the modern age, which are utilitarianism and Kantianism, right? And those are considered the big three, right? Big three normative traditions that you study in any ethics class. Utilitarianism, Kantianism, and virtue ethics. And now all of a sudden we found ourselves at the very end of the term and we haven't studied virtue ethics yet so we'll try to make up for it but obviously we won't be able to. Um, but in many ways it's fundamentally different and, and the, the best way of indicating how it's different is by, by pointing out that the, its guiding question is fundamentally different. Kantianism and utilitarianism are efforts to articulate action norms, all right? What, and so the guiding question, the guiding normative question for those two traditions is what ought I to do, all right? What ought I to do? And so maybe those traditions are, are uniquely fit to, for example, resolve really difficult uh, dilemmas in action, like things like whether or not to have an abortion, whether or not to euthanize an elderly person, whether or not to allow an elderly person to euthanize herself, etc. All those kinds of, right, those involve specific actions that maybe it's, it, we should look for some guidance from utilitarianism and from Kantianism, right? And maybe virtue ethics doesn't have a lot of guidance on some really sticky uh, action dilemmas, especially those that arise in the modern age with the use of technology and med you know, medical science, medical biotechnology. Um, but virtue ethics asks a fundamentally different question, not what ought I to do, but what kind of person ought I to become? Or perhaps more broadly speaking, what kind of culture ought our culture strive to, to develop itself into? Right? And so you have to ask questions about character in order to answer that, right? If you're down, going down that track of that normative inquiry about what, what kind of character ought I to develop in myself, then you know, you're going to ask a very different set of questions. And so the, the whole flavor of virtue ethics is really different uh, than, than Kantianism and uh, deonto than Kantianism and utilitarianism, all right? Um, but, uh, so, so Kafaro comes along and, and he points out that uh, the virtue ethics tradition, going back to the Athenians, has been strongly anthropocentric, right? Almost to the point where the, the whole idea of, of virtue being a consideration for anybody other than a human being is absurd, right? But before Socrates, there, there is evidence, you know, in some really old literature, 
that the, the Athenians or their ancestors or some of the people that lived around there did think of virtue outside of the human being. Um, Homer wrote about the, the virtue of a horse. Arete is usually translated either as personal excellence or as virtue. Um, but, but virtue ethics takes us way back and I would suggest that every culture, if you go back far enough, every culture, you can travel anywhere in the world and you, will find, and you will find a culture that is either still closely influenced by a virtue ethics tradition or at least remotely influenced the way we are, the way our culture is still remotely but recognizably influenced by virtue ethics traditions. Going back to Aristotle primarily. Aristotle was the great hero, the great philo uh, philosophical hero throughout the, he was the only one of the Athenians that was really accepted and preserved and read and respected, especially by the religious authorities. Uh, in fact, that was considered um, <clears throat> Augustine's great accomplishment was to synthesize Aristotelian virtue ethics with the teachings of the Catholic Church. And, uh, and, 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 that's, and so the Catholic, even the Catholic Church has long recognized Aristotle as a master and has used, his doc, used Aristotelian doctrine to uh, incorporated Aristotelian doctrine into its own teachings. Anyway, um, but Kafaro reinterprets Leopold's normative standards for how to judge a, a, a land management decision as super virtues, right? Beauty, integrity, and stability are all super virtues. Um, and so just as we want to strive for personal excellence, we also want to strive for excellence in our community and, and, and yet in order to strive for excellence in our community we find we have to strive for excellence in our ecological community. All right? um, and so watching out for the integrity, stability, and beauty of an individual human is ultimately related, right? Closely related, causally related to uh, to cultivating ecological integrity, stability, and beauty, right? We have to have them both. And so when we can use the same criteria to evaluate our social arrangements and our ecological arrangements, how we treat the ecology, right? We want to treat the ecology to, to preserve and cultivate, encourage integrity, stability, and beauty, and we want to encourage that in our human communities as well, and even ultimately at, our, at the level of our own bodies, right? Our bodies have to be integrated, stable, and beautiful. It, you know, there are many, obviously, many different kinds of beauty, physical beauty. The Greeks would, we have this strange thing where, where we separate physical beauty from everything else. That would be really weird, to think, you know, from an Athenian perspective, you couldn't have a beautiful person with an ugly character or an ugly soul. There's no, that would be unheard of. They, they don't talk that like that. So when they talk about beauty, you know, they mean the whole, at every level, at every possible level, including, you know, the physical level, but Socrates, for example, was considered a fairly ugly man, kind of brutish looking fellow. But he had a beautiful character, and everyone lusted after him because of his character. Lusted after, not necessarily in a physical sense, but in a, at least in a spiritual, emotional sense. Perhaps physical, too. Anyway, um, so, enough of that. I, you know, I feel like people are tired and burnt out, but we'll see how much of this we get through. Leopold and Carson, kind of soulmates in a way, you know, although they, they were separated by about 20 years, I think, in age. And Leopold was uh, about 15 or 20 years older than Rachel Carson. And I don't know how much they actually knew each other, but Rachel Carson wrote a scathing review of, Le of one of Leopold's, uh, another book that was published posthumously because it had too many accounts of, of hunting and fishing in it. And there was, she said it was all too much blood and gore. Anyway, um, <clears throat> but they both are suggesting a, for, a, a way of doing scientific inquiry that does not involve uh, the idea that we should be conquering and dominating that which we're studying. I don't know. We, we've gone around and around on this, and uh, you know what, what? What? What exactly would that mean? But I think Kafaro is is offering 
Leopold, Carson, and Thoreau too. Thoreau was the least, least scientific of the three, right? Carson was the most scientific of all of her writings. I used to assign a little bit of her book, but after a while I realized, you know, this stuff is really just straight up science and there's very little. You have to work to reconstruct Rachel Carson's philo you know, philosophy and ethic, but it's there. I think Afaro does a good job of reconstructing it. Um, but uh, they're, perhaps they're both suggesting a, a new way of doing science. Um, and certainly they're both suggesting their message is the same. Humans should exercise their, their practical message, their take home message. Well, what should we do next, right? They say that humans should re exercise restraint, right? And that's an action norm, but it's also a character norm, right? Just the exercise of restraint is, is a characterological feature that we should encourage in ourselves. Um, because of three separate kinds of moral concerns, health concerns, all right, human health concerns, and these are all interwoven, interconnected. Concerns about the moral considerability of non-human organisms, species, and ecosystems, and then concerns that land, air, water, wildlife, and wilderness uh, are flourishing, right, because they're crucial for human flourishing. All right, and then these are the kind of arguments that Stegner was emphasizing in his wilderness letter, right? Will, wildness is necessary for the cultivation of virtue. All right, and uh, this is from Rachel Carson, right? Rachel Carson laments the indiscriminate use of chemicals that haven't been properly tested and, and all these unforeseen consequences, right? Unintended consequences. And she challenges us. She says, who has decided, who has the right to decide that the supreme value is a world without insects, even though it be also a sterile world ungraced by the curving wing of a bird in flight? That decision is, is, is from an authoritarian temporarily entrusted with power. He has made it during a moment of inattention by millions to whom beauty and the ordered world of nature still have a meaning that is deep and imperative. <clears throat> These bureaucrats. It's difficult to, to not get a little bit ticked off, you know, at the lightness with which some of these resource management decisions are made, considering the effects, you know, that some of these decisions have on our ecosystem. And it, it is hubris. All right. Um, so very similar kind of take-home messages from Carson, Leopold, and Thoreau. But Carson says, I think we are challenged, as mankind has never been challenged before, to prove our maturity and our mastery, not of nature but ourselves. Right? Put it side by side with one of the famous passages from Leopold's land ethic. It sounds almost like the same thing. A land ethic changes the role of Homo sapiens from conqueror of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for his fellow members and also respect for the community as such. So, conservation biology. The suggestion is made. This would be Carson's suggestion, probably, and Leopold. And E.O. Wilson, too. Science in service of nature. It's not science to conquer nature, but science in service of nature. Leopold and Carson both resisted a cold objectivity and insisted that science be supplemented by personal acquaintance, appreciation, and celebration of wild things and wild places. Leopold's and Carson's work is in sharp contrast to the Baconian technicians who sought to dominate and radically transform nature for human benefit and profit. <clears throat> 